Hello and welcome to this meeting on the Wednesday the 6th of December 2023. I'm Councillor Tracy Arnold and I'm the Councillor for Stanway Ward. I'm the Deputy Chair of this panel and I'll be chairing the meeting tonight. This meeting is being held in the Grand Jury Room in the Town Hall in Colchester and it's also broadcast live over the internet where it can be watched via the Council's YouTube channel where there are recording available to view afterwards. Please, with any speakers, use the microphones at all times and speak directly into the microphone. In the event of an emergency, there are no practice alarms, I can assure you, for this evening. But if the alarm, alarm does sound, please evacuate Town Hall by going down the main staircase or the back staircase into the high street, then into the car park behind the Town Hall and in St. Runs World Street, if I pronounced that correctly. Councillors and officers are taking part in the meeting are requested to mute their microphones. Please activate the microphone when invited to speak and turn off the microphone again when you have finished speaking. Members of the committees may use electronic devices to access their meeting papers and visitors are welcome to use mobile phones and any other device, including cameras, but please use them discreetly and set them to silent. <laughs> and good point. Um, Set them to silent and do not use voice or camera flashing actions. The provision in the constitutions around timings or breaks will apply in this meeting and consideration we're given to have an A break around half past seven. Depends on the items of the business remaining. Right. I'm now going to do introductions. I'll ask members of the committee and attendance officers to introduce, them start, introduce themselves, starting with Matthew. Good evening, Matthew Evans, Democratic Services Officer. Good evening, Natalie Summers, Councillor for St Anne's St John's Ward. Good evening, Molly Bloomfield, Councillor for Greenstone. Good evening, Councillor Mike Lilly, Councillor for Old Eve, the High from Rahage, Age, substitute for Councillor Steph Nissen. Good evening, Councillor Mark Gosher, Castle Ward. Good evening, Councillor Sue Lissy Moore, Prettygate Ward. Uh, Councillor Pam Cox, Newtown and Christchurch Ward. Good evening, Keith Park Larkin, Domestic and Efficiency Improvements Officer for the Coldstress City Council. Ben Plummer, Climate Emergency Officer. Sam Davison, Sustainability and Climate Change Manager for Coldstress City Council. Good evening, Mel Rundle, Head of Sustainability and Exec Support to Panel. And we have two substitutions tonight, Councillor Sunnock, substitution for Councillor Dundas, but hasn't quite arrived yet, and Councillor Lillard, who is substitution for Councillor Nissen. We have no urgent items on for this evening. I'm now asking if any members of the panel have any declarations of interest to declare. No, fabulous, moving on. And I'm now asking the panel to approve the meetings of the previous the minutes from the previous meeting on the 21st of September 2023. We will approve the minutes. Brilliant, thank you. Now I'm gonna go into a have our say, or have your say, sorry. <laughs> Members of the public are welcome at the meet, any meetings in our town hall and you're invited to address the panel under the council's have your say provisions. And the chair will endeavor to invite an officer to respond to any comments made. There is no provision for continuing public engagement throughout the meeting. The panel will discuss the information which has been presented in the reports on the agenda and public interaction is not permitted during these discussions. Although members of the public are more than welcome to stay and observe these proceedings. We have two pre-notifications, pre but one, right, thank you. So we have Elia Valentini, who is joining us remotely. Yep. May I speak? Yeah, you will have um, three minutes. The bell will ring after two minutes. And to give you one, you have one minute to, to finish what you would like to have your say on. Thank you. Do you hear me well? Yes, coming through loud and clear. Thank you. Good evening, all. So I just wanted to ask, as a concerned resident and environmental activist, uh, if it would be possible to access a report 
detailing what the panel has achieved to date in terms of results and or initiatives addressing the terms of reference of the panel itself, with particular uh, emphasis on the progress and implementation of the Council's Climate Emergency Action Plan. And, uh, well, I'll also like to know if this information will be made publicly available. Thank That's you. All. I Thank you. That's a really good question because the panel uh, has only been, I think, four years. So it'd be good to have a uh, review where we've come. So I'm going to hand this over to our officer, my hair, Mel, to give a response. Good evening, and thank you for coming along this evening. Um, absolutely, we can um, review the last couple of years in terms of the uh, agendas and minutes of what was um, decided at those meetings and agreed and actions taken um, and it's a, a really good opportunity to review the terms of reference to consider whether they are still relevant and whether we need any amendments um, and we will um, endeavour to bring that report back to the the next meeting so it will be published as part of the agenda and minutes so it would be publicly available. Lovely, thanks. Is there anything you would like to add to the, come back for our officer? No? Thank you. Thank you for having a nice evening. Next on Have Our Say is Stephen Vince. Would you like to come? On the microphone, you will see a speaker button. You press that when you're ready to talk. You get three minutes and the bell will give you a minute warning from the end. Thank you. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Stephen Vince. I believe you're expecting me as I came to the last meeting speaking about the city's involvement in criminal practices regarding Village Green 2417 Coast Road, West Mersey. And I believe the chair was sincere when I was told I would receive a reply within a week. Well, I'm still waiting. The city, the owner of the dream, is breaching the Commons Act and the Enclosure Act by leasing and charging people to use the dream. This is an open secret, and this unlawful practice has to stop. I feel it really is a matter for the chief executive, but she seems to have closed ranks along with the monitoring officer and they also won't reply. So this is why I'm calling on you again, for the city to come clean and stop acting like modern day <coughs> Dick Turpins. He got caught and the city may well end up in court if they don't abide by the law. I know it's a good earner, but it's also a criminal offence. I was told by a city councillor it would cost £5,000 for a law firm to sort out this illegal mess and prevent them from getting their collar felt by the bill. Well, I think it's cheap. This is probably the amount fraudulently taken annual, annually from these scams. The owners of a drain in the neighbouring borough, according to the press, spent £1 million on law firms, and they lost when they tried to overturn villagers' rights. Thank you for listening, and I await your reply, perhaps within a week. Thank you, Mr. Vince. Um, I believe we've spoken, and there is there has been a response, but you haven't yet received it. No. Um, we will assure you that that will be resent to you ASAP. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Right, thank you. you. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Vince. Mel would like to add something for you. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Mr. Vince. I just wanted to clarify. Good to. See you again. Um, as you're aware, myself and other officers did come out to visit yeah. you and Councillor Powling in West Mersey on the 16th yeah. of November, mm. following your um, emails into the Chief Executive and the Monitoring Officer. So yeah. it was it was passed to me to review because I head up the mm. parks and countryside um, part of the organisation, as long as looking after some of the bits of parking. Um, and I did explain to you 
you at, at that meeting that um, clearly this wasn't something that was going to be quick to resolve, mm. but that I would get back to you at the earliest opportunity. Um, and myself and other officers, including mm. our legal colleagues, do have a meeting next week mm. to consider the points that you've raised. Yeah. So, you know, we are on it. And mm. I told you at that meeting a couple of weeks ago well, yep. that, that we are looking into mm. it mm. Um, because obviously in terms of the income that you mentioned, that is shared with ourselves and with Mersey Council. That's not just, it's not just Colchester City Council. Um, so, you know, if you can allow us the time, mm. I, I have got all the documentation okay. that you ca mm. kindly shared with me mm. um, when I came to visit you mm. on site with, with other officers. Um, and we will seek legal advice and we mm. will get back to you. But, right. it, it, you know, it's, it's not a quick fix, as you well know. Well, yes, because um, last year I had um, Grant poking home and another lady come down and I gave him the same facts and nothing's happened within a year. Um, so I hope it, because it is a criminal offence, you know, you, you can't take money off the public using the village stream. You, you know, it's a criminal act. You, you know, you've seen all the paperwork. It's got to, it's got to stop. Thank you. Um, I have next, Alan Short. Good evening, Mr. Short. And again, you get three minutes. The bell will sound after two to give you a one minute warning. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. My, my name's Alan Short and I've lived in the city for 57 years. I want to talk about the continued inclusion of the Middlewick Ranges as designated under the local plan for housing, for a thousand houses. This committee was formed with, um, you know, great, great uh, support um, four years ago. But by then, the consideration of the ecology and the sustainability of the WIC as a natural resource and of a uh, biodiverse area had already been um, decided. Um, and um, on the basis of information that was produced then. Since then, a whole load of additional information has, has come to light from um, experts about the ecology, about the biodiversity, um, and the fact that we've learned that green spaces provide great help in people's mental health uh, in periods like the lockdown. Um, the WIC is due to be reviewed, or the local plan is due to be reviewed, um, starting at the beginning of, uh, of next year. <coughs> Uh, and uh, I believe that this committee is the right body to consider the ecology and sustainability um, uh, situation of the WIC and its importance to the, uh, to the future of the town as perhaps um, a, uh, a designated area of um, special scientific interest or a, a, as a country park um, for the enjoyment of the citizens and the pre preservation of a unique site of over 200 years of, of grassland. Um, so I, I'm asking the committee to, to do this, um, to come up with um, uh, a view, an independent view, independent of those who want to bulldoze the place down and build houses. You should know that the designated area has been exceeded by over 30% in the brochure that the Ministry of Defence is now putting out. You might also like to know that the current Colchester MP is probably as we speak, or it might be tomorrow night, I can't remember the date, uh, is holding a debate on the WIC in, the, um, in Westminster Hall in the Palace of Westminster. So this issue is very important and I'd like this committee to take it on board. Thank you. Um, this is my first ever time chairing and I'm not 100% sure, but my, my officer here, so we need to take that one away. Oh, sorry, Sue. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for coming tonight to speak. I just wondered if we could add an item to the work programme, please, to have a full report, sorry, to have a full report on the environmental impact of the WIC and also to have a roundup of all the environmental reports that have been produced, whether they be by the council by um, defence or by concerned members of the public. 
so that we have a full picture of the environmental impact of the building on the wick. Thank you. And Councillor Lilly. Uh, yeah, um, I think I'll agree with Mr Shaw. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's a massive worry now that uh, the in the, and they say that um, there's a 44% area of uh, natural diversity on the um, on the WIC site and that for any um, plan and application to come in that the a developer would have to find a similar site elsewhere which is um, it's crazy we're going to move 44 percent of a natural environment away from an area that should just be left alone basically we're moving it across to somewhere else so I think that um, with the worry now that the, the MOD have now said that they want to extend the land under their uh, application to further along to Birch Brook, getting nearer to East Holland Woods all the time. It worries me that um, can we trust people like this, that they're really going to stick to a thousand homes. But this is a, an eco climate policy panel. Why are we allowing a developer to come in to take away all that nature? 44% its a huge amount on there, biodiversity. Why are we allowing it as a climate economy to take away all that to build houses on and to destroy thousands of trees, plantation, birds, bees, moths, you name it, it's all in there. It's wrong, basically. Uh, I do believe now the time has come to remove from the local plan on the basis of it's too good a site to help climate change to allow it to be built on in the future. And I agree with Mr Shaw. So, uh, and I'll be taking it further to the local plan next week. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Gocha. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I'd endorse the comments made by both of my colleagues there. And um, what I'd like to ask is whether the remit of this panel allows us, maybe after we've, we've heard the, the environmental reports, um, whether it allows us to make a, any kind of formal recommendation to the local plan committee, if that's part of the remit of this panel. Thank you. Do you want to come on this one, Mel? Yeah, so a couple of things. Thank you. So um, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, get, getting a, an environmental uh, report done is something that we'll probably need to commission a specialist to do. So we can absolutely add it um, to the work programme, but of course it potentially would require funding because we don't have an in-house ecologist. But that's not to say that we can't um, apply for some funding and get that piece of work done, whilst also considering the other elements that, that have been raised. Um, in terms of the terms of reference, Matthew, and I know we were, we were looking at these a few hours ago, but I can't remember them off the top of my head. Um, so I, I believe it does allow us to, to make some upward recommendations to um, to cabinet and to full council so um, that is something we could consider as as part of this piece of work so um, absolutely at your request it, it can be added to the to the work program uh, thank thank you i'd like to just indulge you for a little bit longer because i have a colleague here who knows more about the uh, uh, environment of, of the wick uh, and about its uh, flora and fauna. So he's the other person who's coming to have your say. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. And um, next we have Martin Hugh. Thank you. You get uh, three minutes. Yeah. Um, and the bell will ring after two. Uh, please just use the microphone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, schoolboy era. Um, yeah, I'd like to endorse what Alan and uh, two councillors uh, said, made some really excellent points. Um, so excellent, in fact, that they covered most of my points. Probably go, pr probably go home now. But I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd certainly like to endorse uh, those really important, it's such an important site. I introduced myself very quickly. I'm Martin Pugh. 
Uh, I'm a senior ecologist at Essex Wildlife Trust. I have been for their consultancy and have been there for 18 years. And I've seen a lot of sites in those uh, years. I've also done a lot of local wildlife site reviews. So I've seen well over 100 different local wildlife sites in Colchester, Gendry, Morden, etc. Middlewick Rangers is one of the most important, biggest, and significant local wildlife sites uh, that I'm aware of um, in the in the county. And in Colchester, it very really, it looms large, doesn't it? When you look at an aerial photo and zoom out, you've got these big green spaces. You know, you've got um, high woods in the north, and then you've got the cemetery, Lexton, and then in the south, you've got the Roman River Valley Triple Si and Middle Wick Ranges. And that corridor is an incredibly important corridor for wildlife to move from Triple Si, from the coal and marshes, uh, through Colchester, through the cemetery, into people's gardens. Looks like a big stepping stone. Uh, it's incredibly, incredibly concerning uh, to hear of the plans. Actually, the more I've heard, the more concerned I've been. Uh, in particular, the veracity and the legitimacy of the port reports I've, I've seen and the, and the fundamental data. Um, at its core, it is built on a, really a very flawed concept, and there is a scientific consensus. You ask anyone else other than the people involved, um, from the culture, Culture and Natural History Society, Essex Field Club, to Natural England, to local recorders, county recorders, national experts in high monoptery, little burrowing bees. Uh, you get the picture there, the consensus uh, that irreplaceable habitats can't just be recreated. And the concept that you can plough up um, grass, and which in its own right is really valuable. I drove past the compensation site um, a couple of days ago and it flooded sticky grassland that's going to be crawling with reptiles and voles and any number of invertebrates. As far as I'm aware, there have been no surveys, no wildlife surveys of that compensation site, the sacrificial lamb. What we're talking about here is a comprehensive destruction of not one but two ecosystems, the grassland and scrub mosaic at Millwick Ranges, and then the sacrificial site, uh, which is now actually much more interesting than it was two, three, four years ago. Nothing in nature is static <coughs> things change we have a huge volume of new information even since these reports with very significant criticism of, of those but they're out of date now the metric has, has changed we've got many hundreds of new records including i'd like to introduce to you the necklace ground beetle um you can google that on your phones it's the fastest declining beetle in the uk we're going to lose this beetle. It's one example of species extinctions. This is one of the 1,400 invertebrates present in Middlewick Ranges, very likely present in the compensation site. And uh, a friend of mine who's been recording for many, many years has said that not only the destruction of Middle uh, Ranges uh, threatens this and many other um, incredibly um, rare and valuable invertebrates, talking about kind of our local rainforest, if, if you like, um, the adding of sulfur using <coughs> experimental, um, unproven techniques on the compensation site threatens that ecosystem as well. So I'd like to echo what Alan said to finally, that we need to re review the data. We need to go back to the drawing board. We need to take the, this huge mountain of evidence and volume uh, from local naturalists and national bodies, uh, nature organizations, and take that seriously because ignorance is no longer an excuse. Just final point. A, a development in Lawford was thrown out a couple of years ago. They had a done deal with a very corporate consultant who gave them false advice. They didn't consider the data from local naturalists. Because of that reason, they went to the ins inspectorate. They, um, they, they eventually, after a huge investment of the developer, it was a huge loss, they threw that out, they chucked that out at the inquiry because the data that was available at the time and collected later the lunar moth, very, very rare moth. It was disregarded by the by the consultant. We know we've got enough data that challenges the, uh, the opinion for, for three or four people. Sorry, and I think a, a re review would be really, brilliant. Uh, really um, valuable. I was just, Sorry for I mean, overgoing. That's fine, because I was so involved with what you were saying, and I think we all were, and I didn't want to, you know, sort of... Yeah, yeah. no, thank you um, for listening. Thanks no, for, absolutely. Yeah, and I, time, I, we, but... we're definitely going to add this, mm. we can see to add this to our work program and see if there's something we, as our, this committee yeah. can raise. Any... Uh, really appreciate um, that. Any of the panel want to come in? Uh -uh. Councillor Gocha. Yeah, I mean, just, just to add,
to that. I, mean, I think um, you, you're right. We need we need the expert um, advice. The reason I say that is I went to one of the consultations on Middlewick early on in the process, um, and there was an ecologist there from the MOD who told me that you could move badger sets and uh, basically <laughs> dig them up and move the badgers mm, to another part yeah, of the area. Yeah. And everyone's told me that that's impossible. <laughs> so I think we, 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 it, it would be uh, excellent <coughs> if we, we could do what mm. Councillor Lissimore was suggesting, have the expert mm. advice and, um, and consider it in this panel. Thank you. To very quickly respond to that, I think you touched on a very important point that we are living in an age where um, we can modify nature and the development pressures think, think things are replaceable, they are movable. So we're talking about moving badges, moving reptiles, moving entire ecosystems that take many hundreds of years to establish. That mindset in a biodiversity crisis, um, climate crisis and a nature emergency is incredibly dangerous. And I think future generations, you know, our children will judge us very harshly if we dispend um, and destroy these incredibly valuable wild spaces. Uh, and that's permanent. It's, a lot. It's, it's over. Thank you. And you have been really, you know, given us a lot to think about. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah. That's our work program then. That's an action. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to the end of I have, uh, I have your say. And now we're moving on to item seven, Essex Climate Action Commission update. Um, and I believe Ben Plummer will be taking us through this. Hand over to you, Ben. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, we brought this item to the panel work programme um, as a request, I believe, from Councillor Cox to sort of look at uh, what um, the Climate Action Commission is doing and the role of uh, climate action being done by Essex County Council. Um, just to note, today we've also got uh, Louise Tenekun on Zoom, who's the Climate Action Engagement Manager at Essex County Council. Uh, so if anyone has any questions for um, Louise about any of the stuff in the report, there's a good chance I might not know the answer and Louise may know the answer. So um, I might defer to see if Louise can answer some of the things that you have to say. Um, so I haven't got a presentation um, on this, I've just done the report. Um, but just to sort of introduce it a little bit and to explain a bit about what the Essex Climate Action Commission are um, and how that sort of differentiates from Essex County Council. Um, so the Climate Commission was created uh, about uh, three years ago now and um, it's made up of different, about 30 different people. You've got business people, ac people from academia, local governments and people from the Young Essex Assembly as well on there. Um, and the main action that they did at the start was to create their uh, report, which is called Net, Net Zero, Making Essex Carbon Neutral, um, where they outlined a set of recommendations and actions to help make um, Essex a net zero county by 2050. Um, within that, they had they broke it down into various different themes, and the idea was that it made recommendations for action that Essex County Council have now put in their own climate um, action plan. Uh, which they recently um, updated uh, in October this year. Um, so now what the role of the Commission is, um, is there are, uh, I don't know how many meetings they have a year, but they have meetings a year where uh, officers from Essex County Council bring updates to the Essex Climate Action Commission on uh, the different sort of working group um, themes. Um, and then the Commission basically provide advice and provide steer on the actions being done by Essex County Council. Um, so what the report sort of represents, and I, I, I've broken it down by the mainly the themes in the Essex County Council Climate Action Plan here, it sort of just outlines a few of the, the key actions that Essex are working on and where there's overlaps um, with some of the work that we're doing with Essex or similar work that we're doing sort of on our own at uh, Colchester City Council. Um, so you've got um, I guess quite per, uh, person to what's been talked about already on land use and green infrastructure um, is sort of the the recent guidelines that have come out about biodiversity net gain that I know me and some of the planning team are sort of scrabbling to understand a little bit um, Essex have been looking uh, at their some of their own sites um, they could put forward as biodiversity net gain um, 
uh, off-site credits that developers can buy if they can't meet their um, on-site requirements. Um, we've had a discussion with them about ways that we can use our own sites to help um, enhance biodiversity beyond what we might be able to otherwise achieve if we didn't have an income stream from this work. Um, so that's reflected in here. Um, there's also under that section uh, discussions about the local nature recovery strategy, which is another thing that's come through the Environment Act, um, which Essex are heading up, which aims to understand the understand and put um, a preference on sort of the high value habitats for biodiversity and ensure that they're protected and the council plays a role within that process to put forward sites that we know about that are going to be important for biodiversity going forward and thus should be included within the strategy. Um, I'm not going to go through everything, I'm just going to pick out a few things. Um, on energy and waste is another theme. Um, I'm going to skip over most of that because actually quite a lot will be covered in what Keith's going to talk about in the next report. Um, other than you will obviously be aware that the councils, Essex County Council are working on their joint municipal waste management strategy. Um, and they've had a consultation out about that. And the council, Culture City Council, are working on our own waste and recycling strategy that um, you all have been involved in the development of that today. Um, and you will receive a draft strategy of that in the new year. Um, on uh, built environment, I think one of the, the key bits that I really want to bring out that I think has been doing really well from Essex is their climate action planning unit. They've got a lot more resource to understand how we can yet yeah, enforce uh, climate action through planning. They've developed um, a really good evidence base for um, the technical, legal and financial viability of building net zero homes. Um, Sort of yeah by 2025 they could they you could do that and there's actually they've had legal people lawyers who've actually looked at um national planning policy framework and planning regulations and actually local authorities can ask developers to build two net zero and that will be looked at as part of the local review at the city council so that's really good evidence base that we can use and i know other local authorities have used as well um transport i think you know a lot about some of these projects that the uh, that we've been working on in terms of our air quality. Essex County Council developing their own air quality strategy, which will um, overlap with. Uh, they've also been developing their electric vehicle charging strategy for um, on-street uh, charging of electric vehicles. Uh, I think I'm going to go on. And that's so basically what I've got. You've got all the you've got all the different actions in the report here. If there's anything you want to ask questions about or just in general about Essex's climate action or our action in relation to Essex then please just yeah raise your hand and I'll see who can answer. Um, Councillor Sonnetsef. Yes, thank you Ben. Um, I wanted to ask about the biodiversity net gain and the interesting news that we're creating business cases for offset biodiversity gain, net gain on ECC owned land, presumably also CCC owned land. And uh, uh, just to ask whether we, we recently approved a policy, didn't we, on biodiversity net gain, and it never mentioned trying to create a market for off site biodiversity net gain. Is it now the council's policy that off-site is, um, is to be encouraged? And, um, and when you do the business case, you know, we'll be needing to make those formally. I think it's only the beginning of November it became compulsory, wasn't it? We're going to make, need to make those formally grip an awful lot better. And that brings us back, of course, to Middlewick, where they, I think they, they, they decided they were going to have a bespoke biometric, a, 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 a bespoke metric for Middlewick. And are we going to let that um, uh, that sort of thing slip through again? Thank you, Ben. Do you want to come back on this, or uh, yeah, I can come back on parts of it. Um, so the first bit was about the business cases for offsite biodiversity net gain. So Essex have already developed it on two sites. Um, again, uh, I can send around. Because they're publicly available reports, because they were pre presented to the Climate Action Commission. Um, there's one at 
um, Mersey and one at St. Osif. Um, and they've basically worked out what the biodiversity net gain units on those sites are at the moment uh, using the metric. And then they've uh, said like what habitats they want to enhance on those sites and then looked at what the biodiversity net gain units are, what they would be after doing that. And then worked out basically the difference between those two and then therefore how many units they have up for sale. Um, they've then modelled how much it would cost to create those habitats and maintain those habitats in that state for uh, 30 years, which is as required in the regulations. Uh, and then from that, they've basically calculated how much they think they could sell the credits for. They've done sort of different scenarios based on um, inflation and various other factors. Uh, and we've, at the early stage of discussing potential council sites, that could be put forward um, in a similar manner to how Essex have done that. But we haven't agreed anything yet. Um, so yeah, it's just early discussions on that at the moment. Um, I'm not gonna comment on the bit about the middle wick bit about the metric, but I guess it would make sense to look at it again because it, an old metric was used for that because the, the, the most recent version of the metric has only been around I think since the middle of this year or something like that. So, um, but yeah, I'll see if anyone else wants to come back on that. It would be just really helpful to to, to, to see those reports. Yeah. Yep. Um, Councillor Lily. I, 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 sorry if I didn't see you in which hand went up, I just wrote them all down quickly. <laughs> sorry, Pam? Would you like to go sure. first? Thank, you. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, Chair. And thank you, Councillor Louis. Um, and thank you, Ben, for the update. I think it was really helpful to see how much Colchester is doing and also how far we've still got to go. Um, and I guess my questions are around how we keep this dialogue going um, <laughs> the, and to clarify what the channels of communication are between the our, our climate um, emergency plan and the Essex Climate Action Commission and indeed the Essex uh, County Council strategy or plan because there's no point having divergent ones I'm sure they're not divergent but but um, how, how can we put put them together more more closely um, and are there so that's one thing what are the standard communications between the two I know we have a representative on that that uh, commission but it needs to be more two-way in my view um, Another question relates to item 10 on our own agenda today, where we're reviewing um, our progress on our own um, climate action plan. It seems to me that a lot of the actions that are listed here in this item are missing from the, up, from the actions on the, our own action plan. So how can we align those more effectively? Um, and there seems to be two large things that are missing from this discussion so far. One is around farming practices. We're a very rural county with a lot of agri and businesses that seems to be missing from our discussion here and certainly <laughs> discussion of how our rural wards can take part in in, in um, overall of farming practices and food systems also not big on this agenda so there will be two things i'd highlight thank you sorry i just want to check i i'm not going to respond to the bit about the, the farming the food because i'm going to be honest i don't know much about it um I will fill time just to see if Louise wants to put her hand up and answer that part of the, the question. Um, on the, the first part, though, about keeping the dialogue going and how we overlap with Essex. So we do, um, there is uh, an Essex Climate Action Anchors Working Group, which we as an authority are on. That does include other public sector organisations as well. So you have NHS groups, the university, um, and Essex County Council, where we do share what we do um, on that and I believe that there is a North Essex, North Essex Council's working group that's being set up to sort of share I guess it's more to do with the, the districts in terms of what we're doing on climate action. Um, we do have dialogue with, with Essex County Council but I think it is quite difficult to to keep that ongoing just I guess just because of officer time and things like that. Um, I do find that having sort of discovered about these climate action commission reports, they're really good. Um, and that's kind of a good way for us to keep in, keep in touch. I know they've got a meeting, I think tomorrow or later this week, 
So I'll be looking at that for further information from them. But I'll just see if anyone else wants on the panel to respond about the first bit or Louise about the food and farming sort of bit that Essex might be doing on that. Very quick comeback. Could we have a, a as this this panel to I think have a standing item on updates from that commission and the Essex um, stra uh, climate strategy? Because that would be a shortcut to doing that. Thank you. Um, and now, uh, Councillor Lilly. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a couple of um, queries. One. <coughs> Um, second one down, which is quite a good one, development of the local nature recovery strategy to outline ways to improve biodiversity across Essex. Simple solution here for Middlewick. ECC take it over as a country park. They plant thousands of trees there to create something that will help everybody around the area as there's already congestion through, through traffic, something that we're trying to, uh, to resolve and improve air quality. So it seems a, a simple solution to me. I'm, I'm one of the ward, ward councillors. Uh, it's an awful lot of money though, but it would resolve everything if they was to take it over and turn it into a proper country park for everybody to still enjoy in the future. Uh, and the other one was um, maybe a question for the, the officer at ECC. Creating the draft electric vehicle charging strategy Will they be um, looking to put electric points in existing petrol stations uh, around uh, Essex? As Essex Fire Service are concerned about having electric vehicle charging points in petrol stations, they, for some reason, are not down as a proper consultant body. Now, this comes from my work on the Police and Crime Panel with the fire service involved in that. Um, so they are concerned about the safety aspect, the same as whether you're not allowed to, to, to light up cigarettes in a petrol station. If there is faulty electric lines that happen, is there a public safety concern here? Or will there just be separate charging points like a petrol station was a few years ago? It'll be good to know for the future. Thank you. That's it, Chair. Thank you. Um I didn't notice that Louise did have her hand up um, to have come back with a question. Do you would like to come in now? Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to come back very briefly on the farming and agricultural practices question. We do have um, a number of farm clusters where as part of our as part of the Essex Climate Action Commission's work in particular around what we call the climate focus area we've got a number of farm landowners coming together in farm clusters to move towards sustainable practices not only on their own farms but taking a more sort of landscape approach so that's definitely something that um, it might be worth getting more information for this committee on so that you have a, a better understanding of what's going on there in terms of food systems I agree with you. I think this is somewhere where more work is needed, to be honest. We don't we don't have a fully developed um, strategy around sustainable food systems. And I think that's recognised as an area that we need to do more work on. Um, I could also just pop in a little response on the EV charging point. I have to be honest and say, I don't know. Um, I suspect this is being considered because I know that we are talking to the Blue Light Services about the provision of EV charging points. I know that's a slightly different issue, but we are talking to them about it. But I can certainly go away and, and find that out for you. Thank you, Louise. Um, Councillor Gocher. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Just a, a couple of, of points. I'm very interested um, in um, point 511 about um, the um, looking into um, planning and whether it's legally possible to for local authorities to mandate the developers to, to um, build um, net zero new homes. It's something I keep getting asked about all the time. Um, I'm just wondering how that would work. Would would it be, you know, are you looking into the possibility of local authorities being able to say that, that all new homes have to be net zero or, or all new homes 
have to have solar panels um and um you know is, is it being looked into because it is something that I, I constantly get asked about um and um and it's uh, it's very interesting to, to read that in here um just a couple of quick ones about transport um there's there's quite a lot about active travel um is ecc looking into um putting a bus or public transport strategy in in here there's a lot about bikes there's a lot about scooters and that's excellent but um with the best will in the world obviously some people do need vehicular transport and there's there's the bit about electric charging but what about public transport buses and a bus strategy or a, it just generally that kind of transport as well um i was going to ask about and the other the only other point is there's, a, there's the piece about air quality, 5.14, but then later down under equality and diversity, it says there are no equality, diversity and human rights implications of the report. Um, has it been looked into, the, 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 what the socio-economic, um, and maybe even ethnic um, and demographic is, um, who live in these, we get the acronym right, um, AQMAS areas. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gocha. Ben, would you like to come back? Um, so yeah, on the 5.11, uh, 5 um, so again, that's publicly available information in terms of the evidence base that's been put together. I can share that with, with all the councillors on the panel after the meeting. Um, I don't think we've, we haven't agreed anything specifically at Colchester, but they, that Essex have drafted their own uh, net zero policy, which could then be adapted by all of the district councils um, or the local planning authority. Sorry, um, I think there's basically sort of six principles which they've outlined for achieving that. I think there is like a bit about including uh, rooftop um, solar PV, and I think it's like 100% renewable generation on site is the aim to meet the energy demand of the of the homes um so it might not just be solar pv it might be something else that meets that and if they can't then do that then that the idea is that they would pay into an offset fund to cover the um remaining sort of emissions that they're not meeting um so that's that but yeah i'm gonna can share that after um on the 5.1 5.14 i'm not the best person to respond probably about the air quality um strategy i could i know that there, we've done quite a bit of work on it and i'm sure there has been sort of research into um the the areas where the air quality management areas are and the sort of uh demographic that live um in those areas we 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 know that a lot of them fall within sort of deprived areas in particular like knowing sort of brook street and places like that um and we know that, that that sort of harms their own sort of health and well-being um but I don't know if we've done any further research on that. Um, but we could we could ask someone and get back to you if you want to. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. Um, Councillor Summers. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, my question is also on five point one four on the air quality uh, management areas or ACMAs. Um, to my knowledge, uh, ACMA three was revoked in twenty eighteen. So we actually only have three at the moment and, uh, and the rest are under review. And in fact, I've got a call about it on Friday. So um, yeah, so things have improved. Uh, so um, yeah, we're getting much better on the air quality management. Thank you, Councillor Summers. Count us, and now Councillor Sonnock. You're good, thank you. It's written. So, next up, are we we're putting this, recommend this report through then, guys? Yeah, cool. I've lost my notes, sorry. <laughs> Keith. Okay, item eight, sorry. Uh, domestic energy and efficiency funding support, and Keith is taking the lead on this one. Thank you. Uh, good evening, councillors. Um, so my name is Keith Parker Larkin, and I am the Domestic Energy Efficiency Improvement Coordinator at the council, which is a very grand title for basically administering and running the various 
domestic energy grants that are available to residents across the uh, borough. So tonight's a bit of a whistle-stop tour for um, for you of those of what grants are currently available and some that have just uh, recently uh, closed and what the state of play is um, as to update you on on what's available to the residents locally. Um, so if can I have next slide, please. So these are the main headlines for um, uh, autumn and winter 23. Uh, so the LAD3 grant scheme is um, LAD3, also known as sustainable warmth. Um, we had, uh, we've spent uh, uh, 319,325 pounds and 83 pence of uh, capital uh, spend. Um, I will go into more detail about that grant um, in uh, future slides. So uh, 36 properties received energy efficiency measures, a um, range of different measures, and 63 measures were actually installed across those 36 properties. Uh, the second uh, grant scheme that I'll be talking about is Eco4 Flex. Um, only, now I uh, must clarify the point on that headline where it says only <coughs> Colchester and South End have Eco Flex scheme open in Essex. Uh, since I submitted this um, slide deck, I've since found out that Uttlesford also are doing it. Um, we were amongst the first to actually deliver it though. Uh, to date, we've had, as of today, around 73, 74 referrals to the scheme. 10 have been accepted and passed four technical surveys. Three have been referred to alternative health schemes like the leak boiler scheme, which is only available via the um, uh, Better Housing, Better Health, which are our um, managing agents and partners. Um, there's been three small measures and fuel poverty grants processed, again, only available through our partners. 15 interventions for energy grant advice, 73 warm and well assessments completed as part of that initial telephone conversation with um, applicants. Um, and then the final one is the HUG2 or the Home Upgrade Grant. Uh, to date, we've had 16 referrals to the application line run by the Energy Savings Trust and seven applications via the website which is uh, hugapply.co.uk. Uh, next slide, please. So the first one I'll talk about is um, LAD3, or the Local Authority Delivery uh, Phase 3 grant, uh, also known as Sustainable Warmth. Uh, it's a government-backed scheme administered by the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero, formerly BAYS. Um, this grant scheme has now closed, but it was only available to owner-occupiers to landlords and tenants, and was for only for on gas grid uh, properties, only of which um, there are quite a lot in Colchester. Um, the uh, scheme was, uh, like most of the grant schemes, every property in the country should have an energy performance certificate or an EPC. I say should have because quite often they don't appear on the government website for various reasons. It could be that the um, properties had worked done to it recently but the contractors haven't updated or lodged that um, uh, the, the measures that they've done that would uplift the property and the rating of it. Um, or the rating, it may be out of date, but it may still appear on the register. But um, for this grant and for most of the other grants, um, the houses would have to have an EPC or Energy Performance Certificate of um, between D and G, A being the, uh, the most efficient and G being the worst. Um, Colchester Council were awarded funds of uh, almost 600,000. That was for surveys and installs or retrofit measures. We also had an extra 90,000 for admin and um, ancillary costs. Next slide, please. Um, the project ended um, the 31st of March of this year and uh, very much underperformed, really. We, though, um, the original KPI was to do 57 properties. That was um, based on an average spend that uh, uh, Bayes or Desnes set, that would be 10,000. And across the project, so a house could have a lot more than 10,000 um, installed in it, but across the um, entire project, it had to even out at 10,000 per property. Now, due to, um, we were um, part of a white, we used Warmworks, the, the managing agent. We were, um, they were procured by the Greater Southeast Net Zero Hub as part of consortium bid consorted bid. Although we weren't part of that bid, we still um, had to use Warmworks. Um, so the original KPI was for 57 properties, but we only achieved 36, and that was mainly due to issues such as um, capacity, market capacity, because for um, 
uh, there was a technical um, specification that all measures had to um, meet uh, something called PAS 2035. Now that had recently been changed from PAS 2013, PAS 2019, and so it meant that every installer had to also be um, qualify, uh, had to be qualified in PAS 2035. And there's a cost <laughs> to convert to that. So actually there's a uh, uh, shortage in nationally in the supply chain of um, installers that are qualified to pass 2035. So that impacts on nationally on what can be um, delivered, but that also impacted locally and here. And so then warm work, and there was also delays um, from warm work as well. So um, of the KPI target of 57, we only managed 36, which is still a really good achievement. So the total capital spend was £319,325.88. And as you can see there, 73,441.52. Now that was higher than we were expecting because um, we had to move um, survey costs. We weren't aware of the properties that had um, applied and had to have a survey just to check that they were within that D to G, um, but then didn't qualify. They still had to be um, uh, included in the overall budget cost, but we were informed they had to go to the um, a and a budget, which pushed everything up. So the total spend was just shy of um, uh, 400,000. And uh, so that left us with 277,584 pounds, 12 pence to return to um, Desnes, the Department of Energy, Security and Net Zero. Um, and the majority of that has been now returned. We've got one final figure that we were hoping to return. We were <coughs> hoping to uh, return it before Christmas, but for technical reasons, we can't until the new year. So that's LAD 3. Um, and these are the measures, um, uh, sorry, not slide, yes. Uh, these are the measures that were installed in the properties, uh, in those uh, 36 properties. So quite a range of measures. Um, and as I say, the average of 10,000 per property, but for example, one uh, property had about 40,000 spent of it because of the cavity wall, uh, external wall installation. So um, next slide, please. Um, so this is, um, the next one is about the uh, performance uplift. So that every property had to uh, go up a minimum of two, of two ratings. So if it was a G, you would have to go to E, and so an F to a D, etc. Not all of them were achieved for various different reasons. But um, if we can just um, go through that, please. These are um, where we started and where they ended. Which I think it's excellent that one property actually uh, ended up as an A-rated property. Okay, if we uh, can move on to the next slide, please. The next um, one that I want to tell you about, this is one that's open currently. This is um, HUG2, or the Home Upgrade Grant. Um, as it says, it's a government-backed scheme administered by Desnes running until the end of March. Um, it's available to off-gas properties only, by not heated by fuel, so that can be uh, coal, um, we still have coal heated properties, oil, LPG, um, electric. Unlike LAD3, which was for on-gas, this is just for, uh, solely for off-gas properties. Um, again, it's available to owner-occupiers, private rental sector tenants and landlords. Again, it must have that APC rating between D and G. Now, we've been um, awarded uh, 2,060,000. Um, that's down from what we were originally awarded, awarded because the scheme nationally is, has been uh, late in opening and, and locally. We're again, we're part of um, the Greater Southeast Net Zero Hub and uh, as a consortium bid. And so there's a lot of councils locally and across the Southeast that are uh, um, part of that consortium bid. But because of national um, delays in actually rolling out this scheme, it's been down, uh, downgraded the award from 3.1 million to 2, uh, 2 million 60,000. So that's um, 120 properties that uh, we're uh, projected to be able to do an average spend of 18,000. Some properties, again, will have more spent on them, some will have less, but it's got to average out at 18,000. So the onus was on, or on this scheme, it's unlike LAD3, where people um, applied to the scheme. On this, on this one, they can still apply to it, but the onus is on the local authority to identify the properties that may 
um, qualify for that. So we uh, have uh, various um, gates that we can identify those properties with. And so we had to have um, identified, identified three times as many properties as we actually have capacity to do because of the uh, dropout rate. We've identified those and they have been sent letters. So, so far there's been about six to 700 letters being sent out to properties. Um, we've also identified target areas that um, will automatically qualify um, because of the socio-demographic, they'll be in the IND, uh, one to three indices, multiple declaration. They've been sent letters as well. Um, we were waiting full data back from um, our managing agents, Warmworks, and from the hub in terms of exactly what the take up was in terms of, um, we know how, how many have applied, but we're just trying to get a bit more granular to find out of those letters, how many of those were the IMD, how many have um, just applied on, uh, on spec, or how many have had responded to a letter. So the areas that um, to, are targeted and, um, uh, for, for these, because looking at the data, we've seen these are the areas that are more, uh, that have got the highest concentration of off gas properties um, and or IMD. So IMD properties are in Tiptree, Highwoods, Old Heath High, bits of Grinstead, bits of Newtown, bits of Castle Ward, and they automatically qualify. So they've sent letters. We've also sent letters to where we think the it's more likely that we get uptake, which is West Mersey. There's an awful lot of oil fired properties in West Mersey. Uh, parts of rural north, Boxted, there's um, a large number of properties in Boxted that are oil. We're looking at doing um, an event in rural north in the new year, targeting um, uh, quite a few wards to actually increase, hopefully, the take up on that. Next slide, please. So here you can see on the map, this um, map on the right, that highlights where properties are across the uh, district that are rated D to G. Um, and then there's, the, um, there's a hell of a lot of properties actually that are D to G. So we've had to um, work out which ones to actually target first and where to go. They are uh, all um, applications are gonna be uh, dealt with by our managing agents, Warmworks. Now, the telephone um, applications are actually managed by the Energy Savings Trust, and the telephone number's there on the screen. There's also an online application um, site, which is Hugapi, that will go through to Warmworks. So as it says here, over 600 letters have been sent out, um, and three letters have actually been sent out to the auto-qualifying properties, and that will be Tiptree, Highwoods, um, because we also did some pop-up events in those areas. Um, we, uh, we've done a number of um, uh, promotional events so far, um, uh, 14, I think, in November. And um, that was things like um, events uh, in uh, the community centres, coffee mornings, the uh, one, uh, 360 uh, One Colchester Hub. Um, take up hasn't been great to be honest um uh i on the first slide i think it was uh, 17 um on the uh, via the uh telephone and something like six on the on, online or maybe the other way around um we're still trying to work out the reasons for this um so we're looking we're looking at potentially uh potential marketing including social media posts i know other counties around uh, other councils in, um, in the consortium bid and also in Essex have been looking at that. So we've got a meeting next week where we'll actually be discussing this and just what traction uh, and what is the best method of actually contacting these people. Um, yeah, and as it says there, to date it has been low, the take up. I think, some, I think part of the problem is that people are getting letters and they're thinking it's too good to be true. I think that's one of the reasons. Also, there's a lot of misinformation on social media. For example, on Facebook, if you go on Facebook <coughs> and look at the Eco4 scheme, it implies that everyone's going to get a replacement boiler if you're on a particular benefit. Absolutely not the case. You may get a boiler, and it's only when you delve deeper into the um, um, actual application that you see these are very misleading adverts, and I think this may have impacted on the take up on these schemes. Um, so that is uh, Hug 2. 
um, tell you about the so the Eco4 flexible route. Um, uh, so the energy company obligation flexible route phase four is another grant. Again, it's a government uh, backed scheme. This one has a billion pounds available nationally um, each year of the grant scheme until 2026. So in theory, a huge number of properties could be done nationally. And this one's open to every oil, uh, every fuel type, unlike uh, LAD3 or HUB2. So, and the difference with this is that it's different uh, eligibility routes. I should point out that on the HUB2 one, the um, criteria there was household income of 31,000, total household income 31,000 or below and or qualifying benefits um, or automatically qualified. <coughs> that was the only um, criteria that whereas eco4 again it's um the uh, uh eligibility route or the main one will be thirty one thousand or below but this also has a much more wider scope that health routes are included so if you have cardiovascular re respiratory uh immunosuppression or limited mobility the income cap doesn't apply and the rating uh, property of d to g so there are potentially a lot more people or could be could benefit from this one um again it takes um all of these schemes take a whole house approach so the idea of all of these schemes is okay what can we do we've got the we've done the survey what needs to be put into the house to insulate the house and make it warm and draft proof um and rather than the scheme that i'll come on to in a minute which is just single measures so um it's taken that whole house approach and there is a hierarchy of what measures can go in and in what which order for this one we've um uh taken we've uh we've procured better housing better health which in itself is part of a charity called national energy foundation um as i say we were i think the second in essex to actually um uh, have opened this scheme and have, um, another council did and then had to pause it the reason we went with these is because um, BHBH can offer other grant schemes. So if you don't qualify for Eco4, they may have other grant schemes, um, which will come on to as well, such as boiler replacement scheme. That there's a national boiler replacement scheme, but BHBH have their own funding that would not be available anywhere else. So actually, it's really good for our, our residents that if they don't qualify for one scheme, BHBH will always be looking for what the best fit is and can they be helped anywhere else. Uh, next slide, please. So the Eco4, this is um, uh, the main, um, well, this is the eligibility criteria. And so as I say, the main one will be route one, which is the income uh, below 31,000. The other ones would be health routes. Um, again, it's not something that you need to be overly concerned with because um, BHPH will constantly be checking when, it, when uh, uh, an applicant calls BHPH, they'll be say checking their um, EPC to see that they qualify. Then they'll be checking their income. If they don't actually qualify on the income, they'll be saying, well, well are there any health conditions? Obviously, there's evidence required for all of this, um, but they are the, um, the main routes that will um, uh, uh, be the eligibility criteria for Eco4. Next slide, please. So measures that can be installed, and this is again for HUG2 and also for Eco4. Um, obviously, each property is uh, individual, and so um, it could. The main thing is going to be insulation, internal, external, cavity, underfloor, loft, heating, boilers may be installed under Eco4 or HUG2, but again, there's a set criteria that if if it's cost effective to actually repair it, it may be repaired. Um, but if it's going to be replaced, it would be with clean technology. Technology, as I say, that it will not. Um, it's not guaranteed. Solar um, panels, not offered as a single measure for various reasons. Something else would have to happen before you could get solar panels. Um, next slide, please. Um, on Eco Four today, there's been over seventy applications. Um, um, I put there a figure, uh, don't have the figure that were made by telephone. Um, we know that over 70, uh, the majority has been um, seven, uh, on telephone 
um, or callbacks, or they've been referrals that um, have come into us uh, or myself at the council, and then I've made that referral online. Um, so I was talking about the benefits of uh, using BHBH. So, um, so we've had oh, sorry, seven, uh, so 73 assessments have been done for well and warm. So they're not just checking for eco uh, for, they're saying, okay, let's just check that you're on the right benefits. What tariff are you on? Do you need to switch? Um, sorry, 55 deferrals to scheme, 10 have been accepted in the past. Three alternative schemes, such as the leap boiler scheme, <coughs> only available through BHBH. Um, and yeah, the total number of um, applications that we've received so far, bearing in mind we only opened this scheme in October, um, we've had more applications and referrals than we uh, manage between 21 to the end of ECO 3. So we're in a really good place at the moment to um, be on track. And if, as long as we keep promoting this. Next slide, please. And, sorry, I've got, I'm, 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 done, I'm done after this one. Okay, and this is the main point is that I do um, need your help. Uh, to reach a wider audience, we need to be looking at more exp uh, uh, explanatory events and pop-ups. So if you know of anywhere, coffee groups, anyone, if it's got cake, I'm there. Um, okay, so yeah, um, if you know anywhere to promote these, certainly Rural North would be looking at uh, Mersey, Rowhedge, I'm particularly interested in doing. And again, members of the public, if they've got any, if, um, any interest or want me to come along and uh, promote it to them, more than happy to do so. And final slide, any questions? Thank you, Keith. That's a very detailed report. And I know for a fact that I've seen you many times doing your pop-ups personally in my place of work. Um, we're going, Councillor Bloomfield. Uh, I just need to declare an interest, as Keith mentioned, the Colchester Community Hub, um, and I am employed by Community 360. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lissamore. Thank you. Um, yes, I share your concern about getting the message out there. And I've had over the years a number of residents contact me and say, what is this? Is, is this real? Um, so I think um, it would be really good to look at benchmarking to see what other councils, you know, if other councils are more successful than us. Um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Um, then what have they done differently to what we're doing? Also, and I always say, almost every meeting, use us as councillors. Keep us in the loop over and over and over again. Yes, we get a lot of emails, but we're the ones that are used to speaking to residents, getting the message through. So please use this. And um, I, I, I would suggest if you please could contact us all after this meeting, or perhaps do an email to every councillor afterwards, just to re reintroduce yourself so that we all know where to go because i know where in pretty gate they do excellent cake <laughs> and you will be more than welcome they would love to see you i think it's just your market um i think that on a more serious note what i wanted to really i'm a bit concerned about this one particular property that had forty thousand pounds spent on it now is that cost efficient you know would we do that on our own property uh, I've looked at solar panels, for example, thought, well, it's going to take me 15 years to pay off if they last that long. And if, they, you know, we all have to make that assessment. How did, regardless of whether this is government money or council money, how did we council make that assessment to decide that it was cost effective to do that? Um, that's a very good question, <laughs> actually. Um, we didn't, is the um, simple answer. Um, that it was, so when, um, for the, that was on the Lab 3 scheme, and so the applicant would have applied via the um, would have applied to Warmworks, and then an, uh, an assessor would have gone out and worked out what could have been put into the property. And um, in that case, they'd have decided it was exterior uh, wall insulation, which in itself is really expensive. Um, and so, was it a good whether or not it was value for money is not something I have that particular expertise on and that would be a question for Warmworks at that actually um, did it was it actually cost effective to do that um, but yeah we don't actually make that decision it's down to the surveyors 
Thank you. Sorry, uh, can I just um, uh, come back and also um, on the point about um, uh, uh, take up and getting the message out? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, use, uh, I will follow that up with councillors afterwards. But I think the problem is also, but certainly with the letters that you're uh, speaking about, we've, I've had quite a few um, customers contact me after we've sent out letters saying, is this um, genuine? But also, Warmworks for the Hug2 one have also sent out their letters as well, which we were aware of, which also sort of, I suppose, confuses customers. Added to which, um, there is, and there's nothing we can do about this actually, other than we've asked the company to let us know if they're going to be in the area. There are a series of, um, or a number of companies that are operating in Colchester um, on behalf of other companies that we know are signed up to the, for the Eco4 scheme, and they're basically uh, lead generation um, companies. And they are doing door knocking, saying, actually, we're in your area, we can offer, do a survey free and find out if you qualify. And that in itself is worrying to a lot of vulnerable customers and a lot of vulnerable residents who then don't know if it's genuine or not. And even I didn't know of this company until I checked out and it turns out they are a lead generation company. And all of this, I think, compounds the problem that residents, and certainly the ones that are vulnerable, don't know who to trust. Right? And it's something that is being discussed at a wider level um, in the consortium meetings as well. Sorry, just one thing really quickly. I don't know if you have any literature available, any posters or anything like that, because obviously, again, we as councillors have access to leaflets, we have access to notice boards and, and so on. So if you can circulate anything like that, then that would be absolutely brilliant. Thank absolutely, you. I'd love to. Thank you. And actually, coming back on Councillor Lismore's point, that we also, all of us, have uh, social media pages that our local residents are on our local groups. And if maybe that's another avenue we can go down. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Summers. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's great what's, what's been done. We all know the benefits to people's both, you know, mental and physical health. Uh, one, to have a warm home and two, to have the you know, the relief that it's it's not going to be costing them um, the earth anymore. Um, just just one thing with the um, regarding uh, the targeted letters, you know, <laughs> so about 700 were sent out. Was this in any way linked to sort of like the when the council will send out uh, like the council tax? We know obviously who's in receipt of relief and things like that. So is that how they were targeted or? Uh, no, on this one, uh, no. We did look at the, some data um, in terms of um, uh, looking at who was receiving benefits and everything. On that note, um, there's also a GDPR one as well that we we can only we can we were using the set um, toolkit um, that looks at uh, uh, the, the the ratings and likelihood of fuel poverty, and then we had to actually decide which areas to do as well. But um, uh, no. No, it wasn't linked with council tax. No. Okay, and just just one other thing, um, just in the report on uh, five point seven, uh, it's just it's just regarding uh, your own post. Actually, it says that uh, we had funding uh, from September twenty twenty two until March twenty twenty three provisionally. Obviously, you're still here, so that's good. <laughs> um, so presumably, the fundings continued, or was that a typo? And it's actually twenty September twenty three until March twenty four. The latter, yeah. It, well, um, the funding is until March 24, and there's ongoing discussions um, uh, for the. There is funding in place for uh, 24. Um, it's uh, being finalised in terms of what that will look like in terms of whether it's full time um, or fractional. But there, uh, there is scope for it to continue. Brilliant. Beyond 24. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Summers. Councillor Lilly. Oh, thank you. Um, one of the questions from, from Councillor Summers' one was uh, on Elm Heath and uh, the Hive. And uh, in Rage, um, the Mariners Chapel run a, a food bank scheme. We have cab coming on a Monday afternoon, so that's probably the best time. If you contact me with the details, I guess into the details of the people who run that. Uh, they'll be the best people to speak to uh, to deal with that. And also, like Councillor Lismore said, we have uh, social media, Rowage has about three um, 
really just, um, Facebook posts, uh, Twitter, everything, stuff like that. So we need to know. Um, and in my area, how did you did you target people with with um, say electric storage heaters? We have an awful lot of flats there who have these sort of things in them. And we all know they're rubbish because they're, they're hot. They're hot at night time and they're cold in the daytime, which is bizarre, um, especially if you're a, a mum at home with children and stuff. Um, but it'll be interesting to know how, we, how you go about it because when people respond, we know in our area, all the student accommodation, they just don't bother to engage in anything whatsoever. They, they're oblivious to all our leaflets and stuff. But yeah, it'll be interesting to know Sure. How are you targeting our area? So for um, the Hug 2 one and the um, targeting, um, also um, for, yeah, mainly for the Hug 2, when we were um, <laughs> looking at the target properties, we are looking at house and bungalows rather than flats. That is mainly for technical reasons in terms of the funding for, if, if there's um, a block of privately owned houses, if that one qualifies for benefits, then you have to treat another one's infill and it, it becomes a logistical nightmare in terms of um, actually getting permissions. Because if you're doing a flat in the middle, you need to treat other ones, you can't do it in silo. Um, so that's why that's happened. In terms of uh, landlords, actually we did look uh, for the Highwoods, for example, um, a lot of that went out there. But uh, when it's been followed up with um, door knocking, whatever, a lot of the uh, residents were, were saying, oh, I rent. And so the, it's not being passed on to the landlord, the information. So, in, and that is something actually we've been looking at in terms of how do you encourage the landlord to do that? Because um, on Hug 2, there would be a cost to the landlords, uh, but they get two thirds funding. On Eco 4, it's the tenant, it's the, it's the circumstances of the tenant and uh, their income or their health conditions. Landlord may um, may not have to pay anything. It's, it depends on what the value of the measures are, what the supplier, uh, because ultimately on Eco4, it's the, um, it will be the uh, property's energy supplier that ultimately is kind of invoiced for it. Um, and so therefore, it, the cost implication is different for those schemes. But yeah, we, um, in terms of um, trying to get uh, take up from landlords, it's proving problematic. Councillor Cox. Hi, th thank you. And thank you, Keith, for an unenviable job you have. Um, I mean, this is, we are doing well, but the numbers are quite stark. I'm quite shocked how low the uptake is. Um, I don't doubt the challenge of persuading people to do it. It seems like people are thousands of residents here are heating the air above their homes with money they don't have in a time of an energy crisis and a cost of living crisis. Um, and we've got um, we've got a comms problem. We've got a skills problem. We've got a trust problem. Um, and need, having to tackle all of those at once is quite difficult. Um, we're failing to hit targets and we're returning money to um, <coughs> Desners. So this is quite a big deal, I think, and this committee probably needs to take another look at it on, and assist and help where we where we can. It's, there's no easy answer to it, is there? But um, on the comms, I had two suggestions. One was the volume landlords. There are 25 percent of people are renting in Colchester. A number of them are renting from volume landlords. What is what are the change of communication to them? We've got a private landlords team. Um, are we working with them? Are we explaining the the benefits to landlords? Um, we have various tenants organisations as well. CBH have made very good progress on this as a volume social landlord. Can they advise on how to? It's easy stuff to say. See, from all, the other thing that seemed to me, it's really, really complicated, this, isn't it? All these schemes, all these acronyms, how on earth do you cut through this? What's the simple comms message? The simple comms message to me seems to be, do you want for subsidised insulation? Isn't that it? That's it, basically. It all boils down to that. And if you want more, there are other things. But the headline is, do you want free or subsidised insulation? Can our CCC comms teams not do some whiz-bang things with that? Some videos, some cartoons, some you know from a trusted source. They've just won an award for for their overhaul of comms. Can they turn their attention to this? This is really quite a serious thing, isn't it? Um, to come back to that, um, we are in discussions with the comms team about um, what the best way forward is. 
again, we're um, in a meeting that I have next week um, in the consortia. Um, we'll be talking to um, another local authority that has um, used paid social media adverts and just to see what the take up and the traction is. As obviously, if, 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 if we're doing social media posts that are paid for and not actually uh, getting much traction from it, it doesn't represent value for money. If it, help, um, if it helps us reach our net zero targets, I would say that that, that needs to be to be factored in. In terms of the private rental um, team, yeah, absolutely, we're um, going to be taking some advice from them as well um, on that. Um, CBH, yes, I speak to regularly on that. For these schemes, um, social housing is involved in that because CBH are doing their own uh, social housing decarbonisation fund um, scheme. But all of that, I will take on board and um, see um, how we can how we can get better uptake. But nationally, it is a problem. Yeah. Thank you, Mel. Would like to come back? Yeah, ju just a quick question, Keith, in relation to whether we've had any interaction with health partners in relation to this, because obviously there's a, a big, a Sue, Sue, Councillor Lismore will remember 20 something years ago when I did the Warm Homes project and she helped me with this, um, in terms of obviously the direct correlation between heating your home, which has a direct positive impact on illnesses such as COPD, asthma, and actually get them to do some of our work for us and get them to refer in. Absolutely, I think that's a really good point, actually. Um, certainly on the Eco4 scheme, is one of the referral routes is um, health, is actually getting it out there. Um, and Ben and I um, have been um, talking about this, actually, uh, how do we get the message to the, um, to the various uh, GP surgeries and health groups. We've got a um, promotion next week up at the hospital as well. But again, it's um, that, the one Colchester uh, board, um, that would be a really... <coughs> good starting place as well. Very quickly on that, so the, the, the Live Well Neighbourhoods teams have a focus on housing and um, better housing, better health would seem to fit really well with that and they're looking at how the frontline health practitioners who go into homes can help residents report things like mould and other things and potentially cold and heat issues as well. So I think they're already going out to do that, so it would be really potentially quite a good route into that's a great idea, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cox. Councillor Sunnox. Yes, thank you. And uh, Keith, um, I'm Rural North, very happy to help. Um, uh, th probably through parish councils, uh, where, 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 where we have a voice. Um, the, it is extraordinary that people uh, aren't queuing up to take this money, and it can only be explained by the number of scams, complicated schemes, get through the post everything's complicated and it, it is it's trust for me it's just about telling the truth and telling them that <coughs> we are desperate to get the homes insulated the council is so desperate that they're going to give you eight thousand quid towards your uh, people will be thinking well if i spend eight thousand if they spend eight thousand quid i'm am i going to have to spend another eight thousand i haven't got that at the moment i haven't got time to sort it all out um, do we, do we, what are the, I don't understand the guidelines. I need to be able to communicate what the guidelines are as to how much people have to contribute themselves. Yeah, sure. Um, for the, I think that's also one of the problems as well, is that people perceive these schemes as to be only for low income households. Whereas actually, certainly for Eco4, if you have a health condition, that is exacerbated by being in the cold home, which is likely to be one of the lower ratings, then it's worth probably applying to that. And um, or giving me a call and actually going through it or give BHBH a call as they can look at the, as the fit. And I think that is a common piece as well on that. There's also, the, then uh, there are, there is also a grant scheme available for the ability to pay market as well, that if their income is above 31,000, they could apply for a single measure um, uh, uh, retrofit measure through the Great British Insulation Scheme. Again, the, I think part of it is there are so many different schemes, it's not actually simple for a customer to understand which scheme to apply to. And that's something that we try to simplify on our, our, on our energy pages on the council website. But I, I, I agree, more work needs to be done. Yes, well, I think I think explaining why we're doing things is a good way of building trust. 
Um, I'm going to show my ignorance. Um, uh, Warmworks <coughs> and BHPH, you know, who are they? Are they are they private sector? What what are they? And what scrutiny? They're spending quite big chunks of. Uh, I'm very concerned to hear you say that it was them that decided to spend forty thousand. What scrutiny are we putting over that? That's a good question. Um, so on the for the um, the vast amount of money that was spent, that then um, on the Lab Three scheme, there were external auditors, and that's also been in, uh, internally audited. So everything that is spent uh, then goes to um, the the auditors for the um, for the Lab Three scheme or Eco Four, whatever. But then that also goes back to Desnes or Ofgem, who will um, check that it's within the parameters that actually that is an acceptable spend. So Desnes are doing it, and Warmworks and BHPH are their contractors, are they not ours? Uh, yes. So um, for for Hug Two, uh, the Net Zero Hub procured uh, Warmworks. For Lab Three, the Net Zero Hub procured Warmworks. For uh, Eco Four. Um, the reason we were slightly delayed on that and, and going forward is that we had to put it out to, um, or we, we had to do a procurement process uh, piece of work on that, and uh, BHBH were the ones that um, uh, met the framework. We, we went through framework and so we were able to. So is it right that where we've appointed the contractor, we're responsible? Because if this ever blew up into a scandal, I just want to know that this committee hasn't um, uh, let something pass. Uh, no, with um, with the Eco Four one, um, no, uh, because we don't hold any uh, the money for Eco Four. Um, all of the work that's done is then sent to Ofgem for funding, and the um, they operate, uh, so the contractors operate at risk as well. So not us. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sack. Uh, Councillor Bloomfield. So when referrals are made, who can make the referral to the council? Is it like GPs, social prescribers, other community organisations like schools and things like that? Absolutely, all the above. So um, anyone, anyone, uh, a resident can apply direct to BHPH or the, to the telephone, a GP, or, um, health referral, citizens advice can make that, a, a, a school governor or a school can make that as well. And that's the... That's why we're trying to get that message out as wide as possible. Yeah, so I've been contacted, for example, Rural North, the um, parish councils, community centres, schools. And are the referral forms, have they been distributed to all of these organisations or are they kind of expected to kind of pull it off of the online page? A little of both, I would say, yeah, actually. They, so yeah, there is scope for a lot more work on that as well. But the, 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 one of the problems as well is that actually for, and I should point this out, for ECOS 4, um, nationally, there is no um, uh, capacity um, funding. So, and this is why a lot of councils, um, we're, uh, we're in a very lucky situation that my role is, um, is funded. But a lot of um, uh, count, uh, local, local authorities just do not have the capacity to deliver these schemes because there isn't any funding for them. Other than HUG 2, which um, is uh, part funded, but actually, uh, my role has come from various different uh, external partners. Is it possible that any amendments to the application, like all the referral documents, could be made so that their data could potentially be shared with one of the other schemes? So say we get a referral and we say this is not, um, it just doesn't meet the eligibility criteria for this one. Can we then just pass it if, if you know, yeah, but it is, eligible for this one um can you just change that straight over because i feel if especially if somebody's being referred in through another organization you then have to go back to that organization and they would then have to go back to the person that they've referred to refer them to a different scheme if that makes sense because so we could cut that corner off share agreements i would think probably unlikely however um we have spoken to both schemes. We've got fairly good relationships with one, uh, you know, with all the managing agents and saying, if someone doesn't um, qualify for that, can you let that customer or that applicant know that to uh, either come back to us and we'll refer them? Um, but no, there is no crossover between the managing agent for, say, um, Hug2 and the managing agents for Eco4, other than 
uh, by an informal arrangement whereby we've let uh, ask requested them to let the applicant know of alternative schemes. Okay, because if yeah, if they were briefed on it, then they could say, but I think you might be eligible here at least, and then go back instead of just saying go back to you and then yeah, have that so discussion example, again. BHBH will say no, you don't qualify for that scheme, but you might qualify for this one, mm. or if but they can't do the referral. In theory, they could, but I don't know if they are. They would tell the customer, you don't qualify for this, you could qualify uh, for HUG2, here's the details. Or, But yes, essentially, they'll come back to me. Okay. And on the social media point, is there any chance, like uh, what Councillor Cox was saying, where we need just really kind of straightforward comms and like also discussing the guidelines because as you were saying some of the misinformation is coming from the fact that it looks like this is something that's kind of promised to everybody um and like what councillor sonix was saying where if if the comms had the guidelines of kind of the el eligibility criteria and if we did pay, i do think we should pay for the advertising because when it comes from sponsored by Colchester City Council and they see that on Facebook, that is a, a trusted source and they're way more likely to, um, you know, to look into that basically. Um, because in, in many ways, like I am glad that people are being careful because scams are, are such a huge threat, but we have to be kind of self-aware enough to know that we now have to go the extra mile to say, you know, this is actually legitimate. Um, so yeah, if there could be some conversations about tackling the online misinformation around this scheme, then I think that would be very, yeah. Absolutely, um, and it's, it's encouraging to hear that um, councillors uh, would like us to go down the Hayes social media advert route. As, again, that's something we can look at. I think part of the problem on all of this as well is that off, certainly with the hard to reach customers, they won't apply until a moment crisis such as their boiler breaking or anything they don't know that these grants are necessarily for them or they think that it doesn't it doesn't affect them and so yeah there is a lot more work to be done on getting that message across that actually hey there's vast amounts of money available do it now and certainly for the landlord ones although um the legislation has changed in terms of what that minimum um letting stand has to be it makes sense for um, for landlords to act on getting that message across to landlords. Actually, you might as well future-proof now in case there is a change in legislation or that comes back in the future. While, there's, while it's available freely, do it. Yes. yes. Sorry, <laughs> put it on. I was just going to ask Keith. Um, obviously, with the the low income um, um, people, a, a lot of no, but a lot of, may well be in private rented accommodation. Um, so you can imagine, you know, a school basically maybe says, why don't you, you try and get your house insulated or whatever. So um, they're referred, but the landlord is resistant. Um, what happens in that instance? That's a very good point, Councillor Gautra. Um, in for private rental sector, it has to have the um, agreement of both landlord and tenant. and. Again, that's part of the problem. Um, and maybe there needs to be more work done on that market in, in the comms, which is actually, you, you, you may get two thirds funding if you're on the HUG2 one, off gas, if you apply to that one. However, on the Eco4, it's the circumstances of your tenant. So you may still get two thirds funding or you may get fully funded. And you know, two thirds are better than nothing. Also, and again, we were um, looking at the private rental sector. Um, we have looked at enforcement and how that could be. It again, it's a, it's very difficult though to actually um, to work out how that would work in practice. Thank you, Keith. I've, I think you've got a quite a, a great bit of feedback from everyone around the table, um, especially around the. <laughs> trust issues um, uh, myself last night um, had a trust issue from an email because the phone number was different to the company that I deal with it was the same company, and people are naturally suspicious so using councillors and the Colchester website is going to definitely give a bit more credence to where this this source is coming from um, 
and using us to spread the word would be fantastic. So if we can get that to the comms department so that we can share. And it does seem there's an awful lot of schemes for different things to, uh, affecting different people. Um, being highly asthmatic myself, and I did buy a house with storage heaters five years ago, this would have been something maybe I could have gone down that road. I wouldn't have had, an, you know, and it'd be nice to be able to inform that. So um, if we can have some updates on those actions we've given you, that would be fabulous, especially some media stuff that we can get out there ourselves, and we'll love to support on that. Thank you, Kate. Unfortunately, I did miss uh, a statement that Matthew had to read out um, after Have Your Say. And if you could just read that out, then we'll go for a break. Oh, sorry. Resolve the item. What would you like? Yes. Yeah. Do we, yeah, sorry. Do we support the, the work of... Good. Brilliant. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Chair. This is um, a submission that was sent in to the, the panel via the Have Your Say section. There, there isn't currently a provision for written statements to be submitted to the panel, but the Chair has on this occasion agreed to allow this one, and it's from Stuart Johnson, who says, the Essex Air Quality Consortium has recently launched a new website called Essex Air to provide information on air quality to residents of Essex, along with information about how they can play a part in making it better. The website includes data from live air pollution monitors in Chelmsford, South End on Sea, Thurrock and Tendring. There is no such information available to the residents of Colchester. This is despite the terrible statistic on the website, the air pollution contributed to 5.5% of the deaths in Essex in 2021. The latest data for air pollution in Colchester available in the annual report is 12 months out of date. When will Colchester City Council act to provide live air quality information like other authorities in Essex? And Thank you. Um, if you would like to go for an eight minute break, is that all right with everybody? Thank you. <laughs>
Are we ready to return to the room, guys? <laughs> and thank you. Um, the statement that Matthew read out, I'd just like to say to the gentleman who sent it in, Stuart Johnson, that we'll have a, return, a decision, a, a reply within seven days. Yes? Thank you. Right, moving on to item nine on tonight's agenda. Council Climate Action Scorecard Summary. And uh, this will be uh, by Ben again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, could the slides be uh, put up on the screen, please? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so this report and presentation is about the Council Climate Action Scorecards. So we go to the next slide. Uh, so yeah, they were um, produced by an organisation called Climate Emergency UK. They're not for profit uh, cooperative. They set up uh, around the time most local authorities and other public sector organisations were declaring climate emergencies with the aim of supporting them with their climate emergency declarations um, and in this case acting as a, a critical friend to sort of look at what local authorities are doing on climate action and yeah and support them and encourage them to do more. Um, as a bit of background they did do a rating of all local authority climate action plans uh, in 2021-22 and we got uh, a score of 52 percent for that which is above the district average of 43 percent. Uh, that gave us opportunities for improvement and we did publish a revised action plan at the start of this year. Uh, this bit of work specifically looked at local authority climate action that was actually implemented on the ground, so not plans. That's the difference with this exercise that they did. Uh, they looked at action that was done between January 2019 and March 2023, uh, and they came up with the methodology, which you'll see the different sections that they've got. They came up with the methodology and the questions uh, with a sort of a working group, which included um, themselves representatives, people from academia, people from um, local authorities, other environmental consultants like um, Friends of the Earth, Ashton, different um, groups to come up with the methodology and list of questions. Um, the methodology was different depending on the tier of local authority you were at, so uh, district, unitary, um, combined authorities I think had their own um, set of actions assigned to them as well. Obviously, we came under the district council methodology. Um, and the way that they've sort of, they looked at actions that they believe that could be implemented by each of those tiering of authorities. And the idea was that in theory, each of the actions that they put down could be completed, had been completed by at least one council within that sort of tiering for that methodology. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, uh, so this slide gives you an overview of some of the scores uh, by different sections. So you had building and heating, transport, planning and land use, governance and finance, biodiversity, collaboration and engagement, waste reduction and food. And that, they were the uh, categories. Um, so I've shown our scores for each of those different sections. Uh, one clarification that can be made from the actual published report is the waste reduction and food score. That's gone up. As you can see, uh, Climate Emergency UK actually made an error in the evidence that they used for that. So they docked us a mark where actually we should have got the mark for it. So that's been now amended. So our card actually gone up to 35% now, which it was 34 before. Um, uh, in the middle column, you've got the average district council score for each of those different sections. And as you can see, overall, we performed better. We had 29. They, the average district council score was 29% overall. And the final far column is the highest district council score for each of those different sections. So you can see that some councils might perform particularly well on certain areas, um, but as an overall, the highest score overall was 61%. And this might have changed slightly because they updated the scorecards at the start of this week with new data, uh, but only 19 out of 186 district councils scored over 40%. So we went too far off that mark, but it kind of just shows that actually the methodology was the strict-ish and ambitious um, in terms of what local authorities could do with the resource and capacity that they have. Um, and I'll go on some of the caveats of, of what we're observing and also other organisations observed with the 
the scorecards. Um, so if we go on to the next slide. Um, if you remember the table, I think the highest scoring section that the council had was 56%. That was in transport. Um, this is actually the fourth highest at all district councils in the UK. So this is actually a really good performing area. And I think you know a lot about this work. Um, we're commended particularly for the variety of shared transport schemes that we have. Uh, we've got the um, secure bike park where the pay-as-you-go e-bike and e-cargo bike uh, library is opened. You've got the e-scooters that you can use. You've got the electric car club. You've got the tier bike scheme as well um, and other active travel projects that the team are working on. Um, another area that was mentioned was the council housing retrofit performance. Um, so uh, I don't know the exact percentage, percentage off by heart, but the the average uh, percentage of homes that are EPC C was fairly good performing compared to a lot of district councils. Um, that was recognised within this assessment, as well as also that the targets have been set for um, achieving um, an average, you no, know, all homes being EPC C on the council housing stock by 2030 and net zero targets for 2050. Um, uh, also mentioned was the work on uh, related to biodiversity and green spaces in terms of looking at uh, reducing mowing on some of the relevant green spaces to support biodiversity and also the phasing out of glyphosate that's happened on uh, a lot of the council's green spaces as well and actually only eight councils got marks for that question about glyphosate and the culture city council was one of those so it shows that we are ahead on that um, in terms of our climate emergency action plan that was recognized in terms of uh, the comprehensive nature of it and how we report on it um, each year and including to this this panel um, and also sort of the variety of work that we try and do with local schools and businesses on our um, different projects that was sort of just a generic question about how we do that and work that we do um, that's shown uh, the bottom right photo on the slide is from some work we did with schools back in 2022 that was a veg garden that was uh, produced uh, or created at a local school in Colchester. Um, so this was work that was recognised um, in the scorecards at the time that we've been delivering. If we go on to the next slide, um, as you remember, the actions that they looked at was only between um, January 2019 and March 2023. There are things that we've been doing since then that I think would have got us extra marks on this assessment had it been done at a later date. Um, obviously keeps, keeps talked about the work that we've been doing with better housing, better health. I think that would have got a mark on um, one of the questions where it says specifically about um, offering an energy advice service for residents. Um, we've uh, developed uh, free supplementary planning documents on active travel, climate change, and biodiversity. The biodiversity one has now been approved and the active travel and climate change <laughs> ones are uh, they've been through consultation and I believe are going to hopefully be approved soon. They go some way, obviously that they're not enforceable um, things in their own right, but they do set, we try to set sort of best practice standards for what we'd like to see in, as part of new developments. And we'd like to incorporate a lot of what it says in these supplementary planning documents as part of the local plan review. So that would address some of the sort of missing marks, I think, in some of the planning section of that report, which I will go on to. Uh, in a future slide. Uh, we've also updated our greenhouse gas emission report for the council. Uh, I think this was commented on at the last meeting. Um, we've got, that's now available on the council's website. That's got more information about the methodology that we use to calculate our emissions. That's why we didn't get quite a few of the marks on this assessment because we didn't detail clearly what methodology um, and what evidence and data that we were using to calculate our emissions. So that's now on the website. Um, uh, with procurement, I think we're at a very early stage, again, like a lot of other district councils, but we have managed to introduce a new question on to bid a response documents about um, asking companies to detail their how they're mitigating their environment impacts associated with their operation and specifically to do how they're delivering the contract that they're signing up to, how they're looking to reduce environment impacts and emissions. This has been given a low weighting now just to see how it goes and we will be really interested to see like what stage different companies are at in terms of their maturity of considering um, their environmental impacts and how they actually respond to that question 
they must respond to it, otherwise they, they can't carry on with the tender process. So it is a mandatory thing they have to respond to in some degree. Um, we've also recently um, uh, developed some e-learning for council staff on environmental awareness. It's been rolled out as um, voluntary for now, but we'd like to uh, support that being mandatory for all new starters and staff, if that can be given support tonight, that'd be really good. Um, we've also um, putting together a four hour carbon literacy program for members. Um, uh, I think that was uh, recommended by councillors um, and it's been offered to all the people on the sustainability panel as well as quite a lot of other cabinet members and other um, portfolio holders and uh, different other panels. Um, so this will go some way into addressing, I think there was a question there about has carbon literacy training been delivered to um, all members or something like that. So th th there's there's a few actions that, that hopefully will be going some way to uh, doing more basically. Um, on the next slide, um, I think this is, this is areas for improvement. Uh, I think it's just cut off by the little Zoom banner thing there. But I put the top one there is about planning. Um, this was our lowest scoring section on 15%. I think the really key thing here was that one, it was a it was a low scoring section across the board for all district councils. The thing that it the assessment questions are almost I think don't really take into account is that local plans take a lot of time to produce and the evidence that they use uh, so for example Colchester's most recent local plan that got adopted some of it using evidence from 2012 that was what was available 2017 and there just wasn't that evidence base there for net zero and also there wasn't that clarity there about whether local authorities can actually mandate for net zero homes and higher building regulations that wasn't quite clear um, as I mentioned in the previous report Essex County Council have now got, got a better evidence base about that and we can uh, look at that as part of the local plan review. Um, I think one that was picked out, that was also picked out by our internal auditors as well, was uh, considering climate change in our risk register. Um, that's something we can talk um, to um, relevant officers about. But also, I've put in an expression of interest to take part in a government pilot uh, for local authorities to look at reporting on climate adaptation. Um, it's not something that we're local authorities are required to do at the moment. Certain organisations have to, but government are looking to potentially uh, make that something that local authorities report on climate risks to their local area and actions that they're taking to try and um, adapt to those risks. Uh, I've put an expression of interest to the pilot. I'm not entirely sure when we'll find that out if we can sign up and be successful to that, but let's hope so. Um, air quality has been mentioned already tonight. Um, that was one of the bits in the transport section where we lost marks, and actually I'm pretty sure most district councils lost marks. Um, this was the questions about whether you breached World Health, Organisa World, World Health Organization guidelines on nitrogen dioxide and particulate matter. We know that there's air quality management areas in Colchester, so we, we, already, we already knew that we were breaching guidelines and thresholds on those pollutants um, but we are doing quite a lot of um, action to try and um, improve on that we've had several rounds of death for grant funding to work on the careless pollution campaign no idling signage um, reports and various other awareness raising work and that will um, be continuing um, on yeah procurement again i already did sort of mention it i think the council's procurement team is extremely limited so it is quite hard to sort of enforce new steps but I think um, one of the great things that they've actually recently introduced as a functionality on the scorecards is that we can look at other councils um, who performed well on this we can pick it by a particular question and they've actually recently listed the evidence that Climate Emergency UK have used to score that question so we can look at other councils and see what they're doing well on areas we'd like to improve on and we can directly see that ourselves. We can try and get in contact with that council to get advice and support. So something that I'm good luck to do at the moment, make a list of different things that we could try and improve on. One of which actually I think is community engagement. Um, I think it's, it's a bit of a difficult one because 
with certain projects we do have quite good engagement so a lot of the active travel and transport projects increasingly now the energy projects the biodiversity projects there's established links with some community groups and help ways that they can take part um as a overarching thing with our climate action plan we haven't got something set up today there's other local authorities for example that might have things like focus groups already set up with communities to sort of help integrate community action with the council's plans could be something that we look at we're not really sure a suggestion was made at a recent internal meeting that we look at the residence panel and opportunities we can use for that I, I don't know a lot too much about how that residence panel has gone to date but it's something that i've got to look into to see if that's something that we could embed more into um the final one that i picked up on here obviously welcome um, other ones from councillors if they picked out gaps that I haven't is on um, single use plastic so this was in the waste section which again was a fairly lowish performing section um, specifically on the uh, events side and trying to reduce um, single use plastics and environment impacts of events um, we are taking part in a local authority pilot um, the pilot's run by an organisation called Vision 2025 who are a group of outdoor event sustainability professionals. Um, they've developed uh, what's called the Green Events Code, which is a code for minimum standards uh, that they that they voluntary minimum standards um, for outdoor events to try and achieve in relation to sort of different areas like uh, water, energy, transport, etc. Um, and they want to trial this with local authorities to see what would the barriers be for event organizers actually trying to achieve some of those standards and what sort of policies and practices could local authorities put in place to try and help or even sort of mandate event organizers, organizers to try and reduce their environmental impact. One area that will probably pick, be picked up on in that is reducing single use plastic. So that will hopefully be uh, an exciting bit of work that will be starting in the new year. Uh, the final slide, uh, I think it's on the caveats of this. Um, so as I mentioned, it was only it was a snapshot in time of activity. I believe Climate Emergency UK wants to do this on an annual basis. They'll probably update the methodology and do things like that. So I think they'll um, we, we can see how we perform at, uh, in a future year because I think we've done things where we've improved. Um, I think the key thing is that local authorities have different challenges and circumstances. For example, some local authorities be more urban than others than rural and so things like air pollution might affect them less or more um, they might be more inclined to do certain actions in particular themes more than others because of the resource capacity that they have in that particular authority and it's picked up quite well in a statement that i put in the report from the local government association where it sort of says it's quite dangerous to actually compare local authorities in sort of a league table format although i i, I personally think it's a, it's a good idea in the concept of actually holding local authorities to account to some degree and sort of giving us an opportunity to learn from others which I think is what they're trying to do um again I would argue that some of the questions in here don't seem particularly relevant to the responsibility of district councils and there's questions on sort of developing food strategies at the district council level I think it's quite a difficult thing to do and actually if you look at the amount of authorities that have done it it's fairly low um there's a few other questions like that if you look at each one it tells you how many councils got full marks on each full marks on each question and some are as low as sort of below 10 councils so it sort of shows that i think there's sort of a across the board lack of funding or capacity to deliver on that really which is summarized by the the last point um and I think that Climate Emergency UK wanted to use as a bit of a um, result of doing this study was saying to national government, look, there is lots of things that local authorities could do, but they're currently not given as much funding as they should have to resource and be able to actually implement some of those actions. Um, and I think, yeah, that's the end of the presentation. So um, I did do a appendix to the report which went for every single action gave our score on every single action um so yeah, if anyone wants to interrogate that in particular or has any points to pick up on yeah now's your time thank you ben um and councillor summers 
Thanks, Ben. Um, yes, you, uh, you, you answered some of my questions already uh, as you, you went along. It was mainly about yeah, the, the scorecard comparisons with other district councils. I was wondering who was the highest scoring council and, uh, and, and yeah, whether it can be directly compared. But I've got myself onto um, uh, the, uh, the, their website and I was just comparing us to Chelmsford and we're better than them, so. <laughs> <laughs> But um, but yeah no it's it's just uh, as I say you, you did pick up on that point so that's that's pretty much no nothing need more to be said on that I think. Thank you, Councillor Summers and Councillor Bloom, Bloomfield. Yeah, I was going to make the same point. So yeah, thank you for drawing on that point. And can I just suggest that the first council we look at is the highest performing for <clears throat> planning and land use. Um, I also had a question. Um, you have to come back to me. No problem. Uh, Councillor Gocher. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just wondering if, um, looking at the the different questions that were asked, have we have we gone through them and done kind of like a an audit thing where we um, we identify first of all the things that are easiest to turn from zero to to something else. Um, and put it in a kind of hierarchy of like um, green for easy, amber for medium, red for really difficult, like um, improving the air quality in Brook Street. Um, and, um, and basically target the easy, obviously some of these easy things will be pretty easy. I mean, there's a question about have the cabinet um, and senior management had a bit of training on climate change. I mean, that, that would be easy to turn, turn into a one. Um, Whereas, you know, we all know that there's some of these things going to be very difficult. It would involve controversial um, suggestions, but there, there's a criteria that don't fit that in the green category. So have we kind of gone through and kind of made series of lists and um, so we can tackle certainly the easy things. Well, and, and not just easy I mean, in terms of financial cost, I'm thinking as well, the cheap things, um, if that's not the wrong word to use. Um, so at least we can we can do some of that quite quickly and then um, obviously it would need a longer discussion about the, the difficult and expensive things but at least we can kind of start to kind of uh, move forward on what we can achieve relatively quickly <clears throat> uh, yeah yeah so i'm happy to come back to that um we have looked through all the questions i think what i've tried to do as i mentioned in the report is picking up ones that yeah i think we can go some degree to improving on and as they've released this new data set actually starting to look at councils that have already done that thing and seeing how they've done that thing and, and yeah how they presented it or, or whatever to look at that um i think that quite an important point that would probably be echoed by actually a lot of local authorities is we don't necessarily need to play to the scorecards <laughs> like there, there are some good questions in here and good actions but we shouldn't be doing things for the sake of getting a good score on this scorecard if it's not suitable for our local authority for example for the resource that we have the finances that we have um uh etc if there's areas that we already do good stuff on we should continue to do it even if it might not get us more marks on this assessment kind of thing i think that's something to kind of consider um and i guess the the audit of the of all the questions is the the ease of the action but also the degree of impact that it might have um okay the planning thing might be difficult and probably actually more long term, but ultimately the impact they would have would be greater than some of the actions. But yeah, we have we have looked at um, all the actions. And I've sort of yeah done a little bit of a think about what ones we can look to focus on, and that we already have actually as, a, as already addressed as sort of mentioned in the presentation that had this assessment been four or five months later, we might have been above forty percent. I think quite easily there, but yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bloomfield wanted to come back and then on to Councillor Cox. Thank you. Just wanted to quickly go back to what was said at, um, in the written statement at Have Your Say, because I felt like it linked in with um, your point about community engagement. Um, so it was saying that we, there's a website and there's live updates about air quality. 
and that Colchester doesn't have those live updates. Do you know why we don't have those live updates? I don't know. We were just talking about that in the break, actually. Um, we, because I believe that there are some monitors in particular areas. Um, I know that there are some in Brook Street, for example, and other areas where there is pollution data captured. I don't know whether it's like a, a delay, because it's quite a new website. I don't know whether there's some delay in, in updating all that information or not. But we'll, we'll have to look at that. Um, but yeah, I will have, we have to talk to officers on offline who sort of know more about air quality um, to answer that. But. Could I make a suggestion that we try and get our live updates on there, like as soon as we can? If it's not like presumably we have the infrastructure for it. Um, yeah. I to push that a little further. Can we can we have a feedback at the next session to see why we can't, and and hopefully that we can. Be good. Um, I had two very quick things. One is the. Um, uh, the, the, the time with the local plan and the, you know, the planning and land use score at 15%, we're way below and I understand why, but um, can this panel send an action to the local plan committee or a recommendation that they look at the highest performing um, district councils on the planning and land use question and factor that into their review of the local plan? So that would be for the minutes if that's agreeable. I don't know if people would agree with that. And the second one was that district councils do have food strategies around the country increasingly. Um, and there is an issue of funding as well, capacity, but it connects with so many questions about health and well-being as well. So many, many district councils do now have a food strategy policy. Thank you, Councillor Cox. So can we agree the report um, and to carry on reviewing what other councils are doing and how we can improve our outcomes also to have feedback action for our next meeting um, also can we have a look at the local plan in particular and see how that can impact on our scorecard and what we can do around that action any any other more that can we send an action to the local plan oh committee? can we send an action sorry to the local plan I believe that formally the panel can only make recommendations to cabinet or full council, okay. but if you're happy to let me look into that further and see yeah. if there's any method of, of doing that, I'm happy to do so. Thank you. Recommend to cabinet that they recommend to local. Well, yeah. it <laughs> might be as torturous as that, mightn't it? But well, yeah. these things have to be done a certain way. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the climate is fairly pressing. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, and we have item ten: a climate action action. Plan update, which is and that's back to you, Ben. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, as always, um, I'm not going to go into detail about different things on there. Um, a few of them actually, a few of them have actually already been raised tonight through other reports. Um, yeah, again, if you have any questions about the updates listed or anything else to do with the action plan, then yeah, uh, here's your opportunity. One very brief one, which is Councillor Cox. As I've, I raised it at the beginning, when we, when we talked about the Essex Climate Action Commission and the actions that you listed that we were undertaking in relation to that work, some of them don't appear in this list of work we're doing with our own climate emergency action plan. So I don't know if there's a case for aligning those two things, either in terms of remit, reach, in terms of reference. I th yeah, I, I mean, I think where. So, so what this report aims to do is like <laughs> update on things that have happened recently so since the last meeting so some of the things i mentioned in the essex climate action commission report they might have happened before the 21st of september so it's only it's meant to be like more recent things that have happened but yeah can we note the context of this report are we all agreed Good. thank you uh, item 11 the work program matthew Thanks, Chair. Um, the work programme has had some changes and the panel's just asked to note them. Reports have been moved towards the early part of next year, but they're detailed in the report. And there's a couple of things I think have come out of the discussion this evening. Um, consideration of an additional report considering um, environmental impact on Middlewick ranges of the proposed development there, a uh, future meeting of the of the panel and a report considering the impact that the panel has made and particularly with regard to its terms of reference which was the result of a have your say uh, contribution this evening so that's what i would 
proposed has been agreed, but if there's anything else, please um, feed, feed forward now. Are we all agreed with what Matthew says? Yeah, take that for the next points programme. Thank you, yes. And uh, I think that brings us to a conclusion. Thank you for your time this evening. Have a good, safe journey home.